Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I get questions and comments all the time regarding the law. And quite often people ask me questions about things that turn out to be urban legends. And urban legends are the stories where a friend of a friend of mine had something happen to him. And if you try to track those stories down, you discover they don't actually go anywhere. And quite often there might be a possibility that a story is true, but whether it happened to a friend of a friend of a friend of yours is the question. So entire books have been written about urban legends. And the, one of the most common legal urban legends that you'll hear is where someone will tell you that a friend of mine was out driving and he was drunk and he got pulled over by a cop, but he was anticipating just such a thing. So he pulls over to the side of the road and as the police officer approaches his car, he shuts the car off, tosses the keys out, you know, so it's obvious he's not driving the car, steps out in front of the police officer, makes sure he's on the camera, like a body cam or a dash cam, and quickly opens up a bottle of alcoholic beverage and guzzles it in front of the cop. And by doing that, cop can no longer prove that any intoxication that's measured by the police officer can't prove that it came from earlier. It could have come from the alcohol he just guzzled. Therefore, the cop turns around and lets him go. What could he possibly do? Now, there are a bunch of problems with that, but I get asked this, or I've had people tell me the story now, probably a few times a year, every single year that I've been an attorney, which is 30. I remember students asking me about it in law school. I had a student actually say, excuse me, professor, I have a question. What if this happened? And I've also had people say, uh, I know a guy who did this, and he got off. And I always say, well, if you know somebody who got off on something like that, did it go to court or did the police officer at the side of the road decide not to prosecute your friend, arrest your friend, for guzzling the alcohol? Because did he let the guy then get back in the car and drive away, having seen him guzzle alcohol? Well, no, no, no. My, my, my friend got arrested and then he went to court and he won this. And I say, oh, okay, what court was it in? Let's get the transcript. I'd love to see that. Transcript? <laughs> so... When I tell you it's an urban legend, you can guess that as a legend, it means the story goes back a little ways. So I mentioned to people who've asked me this, I said, it's an urban legend, look it up on the internet. And so I looked it up on the internet now because I just decided this is one of those things that I should probably just do a video about and get it over with. Uh, and one of the first responses I found when I Googled this was on Quora. Quora, which is a website where people post questions and they get answers from people who say that they're experts. And this doesn't necessarily prove anything except that this question and answer was posted nine years ago. Nine years ago. So it goes back at least nine years. But I remember talking about this, like I said, with students uh, more than nine years ago. So a patrol officer is answering the question. And here's the question. What would happen if a drunk driver on being pulled over got out of the car, opened a sealed container of alcohol in front of the officer and drank a lot more before being tested. And the implication, of course, is that would ruin their ability to get you for drunk driving because you may have just gotten drunk when you stepped out. And the police officer points out, he goes, number one, you wouldn't want to do that because you jump out of your car at night and, and, and yank something out very quickly. <laughs> but he, of course, is simply pointing that out. He says, if you were operating the vehicle erratically and you had alcohol in your breath, I'm going to request that you do the uh, field sobriety tests. Field sobriety tests. And if you refuse... I'm probably going to take the totality of the circumstances, which is what caused me to pull you over in the first place, the smell of intoxicants and so on, and decide whether I have probable cause to make an arrest, in which case I almost certainly would with the facts that we have here. And keep in mind that um, the field sobriety tests that they ask you to do, if you do them and fail, then the situation will proceed. So the officer here uh, on Quora says, you'll likely be arrested for DWI and taken to jail. And this, of course, is where your trick backfires. During a DWI investigation, you have the option of either producing a breath or blood sample or refusing. If you refuse, your license is immediately revoked for one year, and such refusal will be held against you in court. If you choose to produce a sample, though, by the time I administer the test, the alcohol you pounded on scene is going to have infiltrated your system, producing an even higher result. Now, of course... You're going to make the argument that that happened because of what you slammed down at the roadside before you were driving the vehicle. But here's the thing. A lot of people think that they can defeat the argument at the roadside and end it right there. It's not where these situations get resolved. The questions get answered in court, meaning you've got to go in front of a judge and a jury if you've gone with a jury and argue the case there and try to get the facts into evidence. Isn't it true you saw the defendant 
guzzle a whole thing of Jack Daniels at this road, side of the road? Police officer have to say, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And then the jury is going to be asked, was this person drunk driving? And the question, of course, is whether the jury is going to buy that defense or not. Because I've mentioned before, we can tell what people are thinking by their behavior. Why did the person jump out of the car and guzzle the alcohol? And a prosecutor can tell the jury, what I think you should do here is you ought to assume the person did that because they were already drunk and wanted to screw up the tests later. So that would fall apart there. But again, just so you know, there's more to this than just one answer on Quora. So for instance, I found a website, Jim Dodson Law, who's an attorney out of Florida, Jim Dodson is. And he points out that there have actually been people who've tried this. Now, you have to understand, if you're drunk and you're driving and you actually have the alcohol in your car and a cop pulls you over, you might think, wait, I heard a story a long time ago. Quick, quick, quick. What? Oh, jump out and guzzle the alcohol in front of the cop. So people have actually tried this. And um, Mr. Dodson, the attorney at jimdodsonlaw.com, is an attorney in Florida. <laughs> Need I tell you that if anybody's going to try this, it would be Florida, man. Okay? So he points to an article in 2012 about a man in Tampa who ran a red light and then he crashed. And unfortunately, in his crash, he killed another person in a car. He then proceeded to buy a 24 ounce beer from a nearby convenience store and chugged it as police came to investigate the crash site. By the time the police could take the beer away from him, he'd already consumed some and spilled the rest. So he tried to do that as a defense and it didn't work. And he points out many of the same things I've pointed out to you previously. And that is, uh, from a prosecutor's point of view, and likely from a juror's as well, drinking immediately after the crash is a dead giveaway that the driver was drunk at the time of the wreck or while driving. Who would chug alcohol after causing a crash other than someone who's trying to skew the results of a breathalyzer or blood test? And a lot of people jump to the conclusion that because we've got a device that can calculate blood alcohol content, that device is the be-all and end-all of these investigations. That device is the arbiter of truth and justice. And it's not. It's simply a piece of evidence. And, you know, the information from it is. And so the idea that you can argue away a single piece of evidence doesn't mean you win. And like I said, this argument's not going to be handled at the roadside. It's going to be handled in court later. And yes, if you take this to its logical conclusion... You chug the alcohol at the roadside, you hire an attorney, cop is on the stand, and there's a jury here, or a judge. And they hear the cops say, yeah, the person jumped out, all glassy-eyed stuff, and slammed more alcohol. So, now, again, you might say, Steve, you got two examples here. Well, there's a, a, a person named Cecil Adams, who's a writer on the internet, and he was asked, because he does questions and answers, and this, by the way, is a question from 2009, 2009. So again, these stories go way back. Um, can you get out of a DUI conviction by chugging alcohol after getting pulled over? The question was presented to him because it appeared in a book called The Bad Girl's Guide to the Open Road. And in The Bad Girl's Guide to the Open Road, the author suggests that you could do this. And he points out that even the author of the book is, number one, it's, 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 it's humor. But number two, she writes, if you've been drinking and have an open bottle of hard liquor in your car, you're already in deep doo-doo. So what do you really have to lose? <laughs> but that is not exactly advice coming from an expert on how you should beat this. So... I would point out to you that this is apparently a widespread belief and legend to the point where I found another law firm, uh, McGloneLaw.com, M-C-G-L-O-N-E-L-A-W, McGloneLaw.com, under their frequently asked questions. I have heard that drinking alcohol in front of cops during a traffic stop might be a good defense for a DWI. What if I keep a bottle in my car and then drink some after I pull out my keys? Will that help prevent a DWI conviction in Fairfax County, Virginia. And, and the attorney here is answering specifically for Virginia because that's the state where he practices. 
He says, we certainly do not recommend this as a way to avoid a DUI or DWI charge. The theory is that the breath test couldn't be used in court because the test is just a measure of alcohol, and some of that may have been consumed after the driving was done. The action might prevent a breath test from being admitted in court, but it does not mean you would not be found guilty. If the police are able to show clear evidence of intoxication based on your driving, field sobriety tests, and or your behavior, you could still be convicted without the breath test evidence. And by the way, some of your behavior is the fact that you jumped out and slammed the alcohol. And a jury would be told, by the way, you can judge a person's uh, state of mind based on their activities, their behavior. How do they behave? How did they behave the night of the incident? Oh, they slammed the alcohol when the cop pulled them over. Why'd they do that? Hmm, interesting. Now, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Steve, you've got a bunch of anecdotal stuff here about an urban legend. Have the courts ever actually weighed in on this? I'm glad you asked me that because they actually have. As you can imagine, a story like this that has been tried, as we mentioned, by Florida Man and others, would probably wind up in court somewhere because somebody somewhere is going to pay an attorney to make the argument and say, what about it? What about it? So we go to New Jersey. This case happened in 1993, but 1993 is the year of the opinion. The actual incident happened in 1992. So someone tried this in 1992. So the story does go way back that people have been trying this or have thought about this at least. Cases called State versus Lizotte, L-I-Z-O-T-T-E, from New Jersey, 1993. Uh, the defendant appeals from a decision of the municipal court in Middle Township, Cape May County, wherein he's found guilty of operating his motor vehicle in June of 1992 while under the influence of intoxicating beverages. At approximately 1.35 a.m., an officer stopped the defendant's van for speeding. In approaching the vehicle and examining the driver, the officer detected signs of alcohol consumption. The officer also observed an open can of beer on the vehicle's console. The defendant did not promptly recite the alphabet upon request and spoke in a slurred manner and, according to the testimony of the officer, was swaying when exiting the vehicle. The defendant was arrested for driving while intoxicated, taken to police headquarters, and administrated two breathalyzer tests, which gave readings of 0.13 and 0.14. These tests were admitted into evidence at the time of trial, and based on this evidence, the defendant was found guilty. Now, the issue raised by the defendant was that after he observed the police officers pulling him over for speeding, he immediately reached for an open beer can and consumed its contents. Now, as you can imagine, no one says, I did that to trick the breathalyzer. This guy says that he did this because um, he was concerned the officer would see the open container and get him in trouble for having an open container in the car, which in some places is also illegal. Simply having the open container in your car while you're driving. It's hard to seal a beer can, right? The defendant testified uh, when asked, you didn't notice this can of beer until the point at which the police officer was pulling you over? Well, I did notice, but I didn't think nothing of it. And they go on and he talks about how he had um, this open beer can. So you drank it? Well, I drank as much as I could because I didn't know what the laws were. I'm sitting there drinking it when the officer comes up. So I put it back down and something was left over. But the point is, he says, police officer pulled me over and I slammed a beer, not to screw the breathalyzer, because I didn't want to get in trouble for an open intoxicant in the car. The judge considered the ingestion of the contents of the beer, and it could be part of the continuum of operating a motor vehicle while under the influence. As the judge said in his opinion, I find as a fact and a matter of law that that would not be a defense to the case, that he, in fact, would be in the vehicle under, that is, he has the vehicle under his control. The fact that he may have turned the vehicle off because the officer just pulled him over does not mean that he is not intending to move the vehicle. He drove at that point. There's no indication he's about to stay at that point. He was simply stopping because he's directed to do so by the officer. So the court actually says, he pulls over, shuts the car off, and slams a the beer. They go, hey, you're still in the car. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, Steve, what if he jumped out of the car? Well, the court didn't buy that. So the, uh, apparently there was videotape of this shot with a dash cam, and the court could not conclude that the defendant was operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of alcohol, absent the breathalyzer test. 
So the question that is squarely put is whether the breathalyzer tests were admissible and sufficient to establish proof of the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. This court holds that the breathalyzer test is admissible and constitutes proof of a per se violation. And the court actually says the fact that you did that doesn't matter. We're still going to hold a breathalyzer against you. I know some of you are going to say, but Steve, that seems so unfair that the court would do that. Well, I think everyone's kind of getting it. We know why you slammed the beer. And the odds, by the way, of one beer doing that to you seem pretty slim. So I know what you're saying. You say, Steve, it's still kind of weak. Well, I got another case for you. <laughs> Likewise, out of New Jersey. But I like this case because the court gave some very, very uh, good language to us. The case is called State of New Jersey versus Deola, D-E-O-L-A, for those of you who actually want to look it up. Uh, the case was decided in 2008, and the defendant appeals from his conviction after a trial in the law division of driving while intoxicated, for which he was sentenced to seven months loss of driving privileges uh, and to pay some fines and costs and some community service and a $75 safe neighborhood assessment. On appeal, defendant argued two points, one of which was the cop didn't show up at the first trial and he thought the case should have gotten thrown out at that point. The court said no. So that's another story we've talked about before, but we won't go there today. Issue number two, the finding of after-accident consumption of alcohol by the trial court prohibited a finding of guilt with respect to violation of the drunk driving statutes. If such a finding can be sustained, the imposed license suspension of seven months was improper. So that's the guy's argument. He's saying, look, after I got pulled over, I drank some alcohol, and that ruins this entire case of prosecution. He got convicted. So up on appeal, he's making the argument again. Court of Appeals, Appellate Division, says we reject these arguments, and we affirm. They say on August 25th, 2006, a little more recent, at about 4 p.m., defendant and his friend went to a bar and consumed alcohol. The two of them contended they remained at the bar for about an hour, and they each consumed about three beers. They left in defendant's truck. Defendant was driving, intending to take the other guy home. After driving 10 or 15 minutes, a mechanical problem occurred with one of the wheels of the truck, causing defendant to lose control and go off the roadway, making contact with the utility pole. Had nothing to do with the alcohol, had to do with that failure with the wheel. The defendant and the passenger had a friend who lived nearby, about 100 or 200 yards away from the accident scene. And although defendant could not drive the vehicle in a forward direction because of the damage, he was able to drive it in reverse to his friend's house. So as you can imagine, when you find yourself pulling your vehicle away from a utility pole you just hit and reversing your car all the way to your friend's house. There's nothing wrong with this picture. Uh, there, he backed into the driveway about 15 feet off the road. There, he also called a friend who's a tow truck operator. And that's somebody he knows. And then the two of them, that is the defendant and his passenger, sat in the truck waiting. But the vehicle's off the road. It's not running. In fact, it's probably not even drivable. But someone else went and called the cops. And the cops showed up between 8 and 8.30 in the evening. They did not see the vehicle, though, at the pole, but they saw gouge marks made in the roadway by the damaged wheel, and those gouge marks led them to the truck in the driveway at the friend's house. When the police arrived, the uh, tow truck driver had already loaded the truck onto his flatbed truck. So at that moment in time, the guys aren't even in the vehicle because the truck is on the flatbed. Cops walk up and detect an odor of alcohol emanating from the driver's breath. They asked whether he'd consumed any alcohol, and he said he had, and he told the story about going to the bar. He wound up uh, blowing a .15, which is enough to be drunk. Questioned uh, at the station house, he acknowledged that he consumed a couple of beers at the bar, was unsure of the time frame, and uh, he did not consume any alcohol after the accident. But later... He changed the story and said that he did consume some alcohol after the accident. Now, I know you're thinking, you're say, Steve, are you going to say that the alcohol, because he said it later, doesn't count? No, no, no. The court actually says, we're going to assume for a moment that that's a true story, that, that they got to the guy's house, the vehicle is, is, you know, they're waiting for a tow truck, and the guy says at that point in time, he drank some alcohol. So at trial, the cops testified. Then the de defendant testified in his own defense. And he also called his 
passenger and the tow truck driver. And it says here, the sole issue in dispute was whether or not defendant's intoxication resulted from the consumption of alcohol after the accident. That's the entire question. Defendant testified that upon arriving at the friend's driveway, he was nervous and upset and wanted to take a Xanax. (laughs) Needing some liquid for the purpose, he reached in the back of the truck and retrieved a bottle of vodka. Drinking from the bottle, he washed down the Xanax. According to the defendant and the passenger, they then sat there, each taking five or six swigs of vodka directly from the bottle. At some time... The owner of the home came out and talked to the men. When they explained what was going on, he then gave each of them a bottle of beer. The men drank the beer. And when the police arrived, they tossed the bottles into a nearby hedgerow. The police did not see defendant, and his passenger discarded the bottles. They did not recover the bottles. So the story is, sober as church mice, driving the vehicle backwards with a broken wheel down the road to get to my friend's house. Once we're there, sitting on the porch, drinking vodka, taking prescription drugs, drinking beer. But when the cops show up, there's no evidence of any of this. But let's assume for a moment that's all true. Let's assume for a moment it's all true. So the tow truck driver said he received a call from the defendant about 6.45. Took him about an hour to get there. He saw a defendant drinking from a bottle of beer. So the tow truck driver actually confirms it. Says, yeah, I saw him drinking beer. And he saw the defendant discard the bottle into the hedgerow when the police arrived. The municipal court judge credited the tow truck driver's testimony and accepted defendants and passengers' testimony that they each drank up to a bottle of beer that was given to them by the homeowner after the accident. Now, the judge didn't buy the argument about the vodka. The judge noted the significant gap in time between when defendant and the passenger claimed they left the bar when the accident was called in. He concluded that the bulk of this drinking took place before the operation of the motor vehicle. He therefore rejected the defense that defendant's intoxication at the time of operation was not proven and found defendant guilty. But here's where it gets good. The first appeal of the case went in front of a judge named Forrester. And he went through the entire case and concluded that the consumption of a bottle of beer after the accident did not preclude a finding of guilt, noting that defendant's consumption of beer was voluntary and happened in a short duration after the accident. The judge concluded... To dismiss defendant's charges based upon this finding would lead to the absurd result that anyone wishing to avoid a DWI conviction would merely have to drink alcohol after operation. So the judge is arguing and pointing out that this entire notion that you can slam alcohol after you've been pulled over, but before you've been breathalyzed, that you can do that and get away with it is absurd is absurd. And by the way, before you say, Steve, that's just one man's opinion. Well, it's, it's, it's a judge's opinion on appeal. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, whether your opinion counts, whether the cop's opinion counts, or whether the judge on appeal looking at your conviction, whether his opinion counts, I would argue that that opinion is the one that matters. So again, you might think that that's bad reasoning. You might think that the judges are wrong. You might think this is a great idea. As an attorney, my job is not to tell you whether or not an argument is clever. It's not my job to tell you if an argument is interesting. It's my job to tell you whether an argument will work legally. And I'm here to tell you that the court concluded to dismiss defendant's charges based upon this finding would lead to the absurd result that anyone wishing to avoid a DWI conviction would merely have to drink alcohol after operation. And so that, I will admit, also happened in New Jersey. That case came down in 2008. And uh, apparently, there's enough of these cases out there to where people are familiar with this and actually are trying it from time to time when they get themselves pulled over to the side of the road and they go, wait, I got more alcohol in the car. Now, I would argue and suggest that if you're drunk driving and you get pulled over by the cops, and you've got more alcohol in the car, you have some pretty serious problems to deal with. But we're talking about this on a hypothetical or theoretical basis. And so the question is, is this a sound argument? Is this something you should try? I would suggest it is not a good idea. I would suggest it's not a good idea. But but 
you don't have to take my word for it. Like I said, there's two appellate cases I found out of New Jersey pointing out that it doesn't work. And the other examples of, of people trying this, I've never seen an example where it did work. So if you are in my audience and you say to yourself, Steve, I don't believe this is an urban legend. A friend of a friend of mine actually did this. Well, what you need to do is ask your friend what court was it in and uh, you, you should know your friend's name. And what date approximately was it? And that way we can go pull the transcripts of it. I'd love to see the transcripts of somebody who made this argument in court and got this thing thrown out. And by the way, I've got attorneys in my audience. So if there's any attorneys in my audience who have successfully defended somebody who pulled this trick, you could obviously find the information because you'd pull it off your file and get the case number. You'd know what court it's in. Get the transcripts. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. And, and, if, and if you tell me, Steve, I don't, I don't have time to do that because people always tell me that. I, I did this, but I haven't got time to get you the evidence. Um, if you legitimately can get me those transcripts, email me, steve at latoslaw.com, and I'll pay you for them. I'll pay, I'd love to see those transcripts. I'd love to see them. But I can tell you that when it comes to urban legends, unfortunately, when you start poking at them to figure out how much truth there is to them, there usually is none. And, and if you don't know, this is an author named Jan Harold Brunvon. He's a, a professor out west. He's written a series of books on urban legends. And urban legends are those stories where a friend of a friend of a friend has been crazy happened to him. And then later on, someone else claims it happened to their friend of a friend. And I like to tell the story about how when I was in high school, I was a junior in high school, and a girl who's in the senior class uh, at the same high school came into school all excited one day and told people, anybody who'd listen, that her dad was getting her a Trans Am for 50 bucks. A Trans Am for 50 bucks. And now I'd never heard of an urban legend back then, but, but I didn't think it sounded right. And I said, tell me the story. And she said, well, my dad knows somebody who works at the police department and a kid got this Trans Am for his birthday and then he committed suicide and, and, and he died in the car. And so they, they impounded the car and now they can't get rid of it. They take it to police auctions and no one will buy it because they can't get the smell of the dead body out of it. And so they told my dad, if you want it, 50 bucks, it's yours. Just come get it. She goes, so I'll have that car. And there are people nearby going, ooh, gross. That's gross. You want a car that stinks like a dead body? And she goes, no, I figure I just you know, leave the doors open air it out, shampoo, everything. It's got to eventually get rid of the smell, right? I go, Joanne, I'll use that name because it was a real name. You understand that the hood on that car is worth more than 50 bucks. The wheels are worth more than 50 bucks. The engine's worth more than 50 bucks. There's no way they took that car to an auction and tried to sell it and couldn't get 50 bucks for it. And she's like, you'll see, I'll have that car next week. <laughs> couple of weeks goes by and trust me when I was in high school I was the kind of person who'd poke at something like that hey Joanne where's the car shut up <laughs> and it didn't even occur to me at that time to ask wait why would the car now be owned by the police department if a kid committed suicide in it the family would still own it it's not evidence of, of huh <laughs> but Years later, when I was reading The Vanishing Hitchhiker or The Choking Doberman or any one of the books written by Jan Harold Brunvand, professor, I remember he had a chapter in there and actually had several chapters because there's variations on that one. But one of them is the car that no one wants to buy because someone committed suicide in it. It's just can't get the smell out. Ooh, gross. Uh, and like I said, urban legend, but I actually know somebody who said... <laughs> that their father knew a guy who could get this car for her. Never happened. Never happened. So I know what you're saying. You say, Steve, people have tried this. Yes, they have. They've tried it because they've heard the legend. And by the way, people who've tried it tended to be drunk at the roadside. And people at the roadside who are drunk don't often make the best decisions. Um, I've represented people for drunk driving before, and I've also known people who have. And I can tell you that I've seen a police report where it said a man is pulled over for drunk driving. When asked to recite the ABCs, he sang them. And uh, he hadn't been told to do A through Z. He'd been told to do like W through Z. <laughs> but he sang his way to W just to make sure that, you know, he got himself out. So people at the roads that don't make the best decisions. But as for whether this is a good idea or whether it would work, I would suggest no, it's not a good idea. And no, it doesn't work. But if anybody out there has got the transcript of the one time it worked, Contact me. We'll work something out. I'd love to see it. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. 
One million million microphones equals one megaphone.